it's very important to the process of understanding Google Cloud and pass the certification exam that you go through the question and attempt answering it yourself first. So pause the video, work through the question. We'll catch up in just a little while and I'll show you how I do it. In this project scenario, you are designing a mobile chat application. You want to ensure that people cannot spoof chat messages by proving that a message was sent by a specific user. What should you do? So fairly straightforward question. A chat application that you're writing has to ensure that messages sent between two people are proven to be coming from the other person. It cannot have been sent by anybody else. So the statement that ensure that people cannot spoof chat messages means that we have to ensure that the message was either not tampered with or it was not sent by somebody completely new, right? I mean, somebody who has access to some kind of credentials that allow them to send messages on that person's behalf. So we have to ensure that the message originated from a particular person and that what we received was exactly what was sent. Right. So those are the two things that we need to have as part of this requirement. Given that, let us look at what this means. So let us say a person, Alice, is sending a message to Bob. Right. So she's sending it to him. We want to ensure that the message received by Bob is exactly what was sent by Alice. If for some reason there is somebody sitting in the middle who has got access to the traffic that is sent that is going from her to him, it is possible that they can take their traffic, tamper with it, put maybe something malicious or just read that information and pass on say something different to the receiver. If this be the case, then the receiver should completely reject that message and say, Sorry, I know that this message has not come from the person I trust and therefore I'm rejecting it. Now you think, where could this happen? This is a very common attack called man in the middle, right? In the transfer of data from her to him, from Alice to Bob, there is somebody sitting in the middle who is able to spy on the traffic that is going through. So for example, let's say you're connecting to a public Wi-Fi. Right? You don't know who's running that Wi-Fi. Maybe it is a malicious actor. Maybe they're able to get all the data packets, figure out what you're sending and do something bad with it. Right? Maybe it is a password you're sending to a, a server. Maybe it is private information that you're sending to a friend. Right? So whether it's a Wi-Fi in between, in some cases it might be the ISP itself. The ISP that you have signed up with has access to all the data that is being transferred. Right? All the packets that are being sent goes through, say, a uh, central uh, network. They could potentially snoop on it. And if it's, say, a bad actor, like, say, bad governments, they could have private information that you don't want them to see. So the requirement here is to guard against these man-in-the-middle attacks. A simple way to do this would be to ensure that the sender and the receiver has some unique knowledge that nobody else has. Say something like a shared code, a shared key. We call it a shared key. We have to ensure that when this conversation is happening, nobody else has access to this private key. And therefore, something coded, encoded by the sender is or can only be decoded by the receiver and nobody else. So even if somebody is snooping in between, they're not going to make sense of it. right? So if you get the data, it looks all garbled to you. You don't know how to decode it and therefore you don't have any use for it. Even if you chose to tamper with it, it will be identified by the receiver that, hey, this did not come from the originator that are expecting it from and the receiver will reject that message. With those requirements, now let's look at the options. Option A suggests that you encrypt the message client side using block-based encryption with a shared key. So a shared key essentially means that the sender and the receiver knows about 
the secret code and the sender is able to encode it and the receiver is able to decode it using the same shared key and this would work right if nobody else knew about those shared keys this would completely work however shared keys typically have a problem that they can't be kept secret forever somebody is going to leak it right and once you have the shared key a man in the middle who is listening to all these messages can tamper with any of the messages right maybe they are sending private uh, information about their opinions or who they like and this man in the middle could change it and make it look like something else or once this hacker this attacker has access to the shared key he could originate new messages sent to either the receiver or the sender this either to Alice or Bob thus making it look like somebody else a uh, an um a good party sent that message when in fact it was a bad party that sent that message so shared keys are likely to be exposed or leaked at some point and therefore this is a dangerous approach so we will eliminate option a option b suggests that you tag messages client side with the originating user identifier and the destination user identifier well the problem with this is that if the man in the middle gets any one message he now gets to know both the ids right he will get the user id the sender id and on the receiver id also so if he wants to send new messages like right, create malicious messages and then send it he can just use the same ids and send those messages which definitely is not what we want so the if the message itself contains the identifier or the shared key it's definitely a problem and therefore that is not going to be allowed and we will eliminate option b option c suggests that you use a trusted certificate authority to enable ssl connectivity between the client application and the server to understand this we will do a little more study now there are various kinds of encryption what is relevant for us now is one thing called symmetric key encryption and asymmetric key encryption in a very simplified form a symmetric key encryption means that the sender and the receiver has either the same shared key or something that they can derive the shared key from right there is some way that they have common knowledge the way the symmetric key works would be something like this right so if x was the input data and then you apply some function on it right using your shared key code let's say you get the result y okay so simplified i'm just going to say let's say x plus code is equal to y now on the receiving side you receive y and now if you apply that function in reverse right you get back the original data right so in this case x plus the code will gives you y you send y over y minus that code will give you x so very simple thing could be if you want to send a message say a b c from one sender to the other you could say we're going to shift every letter by one letter right in the alphabet so a b c would be transmitted as b c d when you receive it on the um on the receiving side you just have to do the reverse and say we are going to shift it back by one so abc encoded as bcd now it is decoded again back into abc by shifting it one spot on the alphabet so it's a very simple cipher a very simple code and obviously the the ones that you typically use are not going to be that simple but at least it explains the concept now asymmetric key encryption works with the magic of mathematics okay in the earlier case we saw that this particular code or key applied say in reverse gives gives you the original data but with asymmetric key encryption you are basically starting off with um you're starting off with two 
two keys. Okay, there is a public key and a private key that is derived from some common starting point, right? So this, these two keys are related in some way because they started off from some common point. The interesting thing about the asymmetric key is that if you apply the function with the input data x and say x some function with the public key gives you the output y. Now y if you again apply the public key you will just get garbage. Okay, So difference between the asymmetric key and the symmetric key is that the code is applied on either side. Whereas here, if you apply the same encoding mechanism on the other side in reverse or otherwise, you're going to end up with garbage. Okay. With the magic of mathematics, only y into the private key is going to get you back x. So you start with the public key, encode the data, get y. And now only the private key is going to get you back the original data x. So the way you work with asymmetric key encryption is basically if let's say a server wants to have people connect securely to it, it gets a public key private key combination. It generates these keys starting from a certificate authority. So there are a few certificate authorities that are authorized uh, across the world. You get a, a certificate with your public key private key as a um, as a part of this process in step one. Once you get that, you can then give out your public key to anybody in the world. right? So once you have these two keys, you keep the private key with yourself and make sure that nobody else knows about it. But then the public key you distribute to anybody who wants. Now the public which has access to the pub, uh, public key, right? anybody who's got access to the public key, if they want to send any information to the server in this case, they can encrypt it using the public key. So anybody choosing to send data can encrypt using the public key. Now, who can decrypt it? Only the person, only the uh, system that has got the private key. Right? So whoever wants can encrypt the data and send it, but the only entity that can decrypt and read the data is the person who holds the private key. So even if there was a man in the middle somewhere here listening to all the data, they wouldn't have the private key to be able to decrypt it. Right? They would just end up with garbage. So this ensures that data goes between the sender and the receiver in an encrypted secure fashion. This method is what is essentially used by the SSL connectivity over HTTP. So HTTP plus SSL, commonly uh, referred to as HTTPS, uses a two-part handshake to arrive at a symmetric key. So in step one, it uses asymmetric encryption to exchange a symmetric key. So in this case, what would happen is, the sender who wants to send some information will generate a key, encode that using the public key and send it across to the server. Only the server is able to now decrypt the key, decrypt the message that was received, and now it is able to get the shared key. Right? So now both the sender and the receiver end up with a shared key. Once that symmetric key is available, now further communication will just use a symmetric key. Right? You don't need to use the symmetric encryption each time, which is much more costlier and time consuming. Instead, you use a symmetric key, which is much easier. Right? So using a two-part handshake, it is able to ensure that data going between the sender and the receiver is sure to be encrypted and it can guarantee itself that it has not been spoofed or tampered. Once a session is established, it is unlikely that anyone else will get access to that same key. right? And that key keeps changing. The symmetry key that is transferred keeps changing each time you connect to the backend server. So, this is a very good way to ensure that the sender and the receiver are, are ensured that the data that is sent by the sender has not been tampered or tampered with or spoofed. Okay. 
So therefore, this is a great option and we are going to retain that as something that we might choose later. But we still have one more option to look at. Option D suggests that you use public key infrastructure to encrypt the message client side using the originating user's private key. Now, what does this mean? If you remember the earlier case where you had a person using, say, a server, right? So typically, when you use, say, Gmail or if you go to cloud.google.com or console.cloud.google.com, it is going to be an HTTPS endpoint. The scheme used to connect is going to be HTTPS, right? It is going to be secure. But in that case, it is only the server that has got the certificate. Each user does not have a certificate, right? So that works in a way where the server is trusted, but when you start that connection, all the connections are not trusted, right? The people who are sending the first information should not be trusted unless there is further authentication authorization somewhere. The public key infrastructure works differently in that both the sender and the receiver are both going to have to get a certificate, right? So both Alice and Bob in this case reach out to the certificate authority and get a public key and a private key for both of them. Right? So Alice can share its her private uh, sorry her public key with everybody, and Bob can share his private key with everybody. And again, without getting into detail, there is a way in which if say Bob wants to send a message to Alice, it can use both its uh, signing mechanism and the public key to transfer something such that only Alice can read it and this also vice versa right so if Alice wants to send to Bob it can use Bob's um, public key and some other um, uh, signature based on Alice's own key to ensure that only Bob is able to read that message We've you know glossed over it very quickly, but essentially the public key infrastructure allows data to be transferred tamper proof, right? Very similar to what we were doing with the HTTP SSM. But the difference here is that the sender is also verified as a specific user. Whereas if you saw in the earlier case, the first transmission is from somebody who's untrusted. So even using the public key infrastructure mechanism to encrypt a message, it is possible to transfer these messages uh, without it being spoofed. Right? So now we've got two options, C and D. The key difference, like I said, between this is that HTTP SSL starts off with only one person having the, um, the certificate, whereas PKA has both people having the certificate. right? Now, what is the requirement? The requirement is that we have to prove that a message was sent by a specific user. So obviously in this case, since the PKA infrastructure requires both parties to have a certificate, this is more suitable for the requirement where every person who is communicating with each other has to be identified. So when you're sending chat messages, say between you and your friend, you want to ensure it came exactly from that user, right? It's that initial connection is not happening uh, as if you are the server and that person is a client, right? So you're not separate server client mechanism each time you want to send a message. Instead, each of you have uh, a certificate that ensures that messages being sent are not being spoofed in between. So the right answer for this question, therefore, is to choose option D, which is to use a public key infrastructure to encrypt the message client side using the originating user's private key. Now, it's time to subscribe to all the great content we've got lined up for you to learn Google Cloud and to help you with the certifications.